We up? You good? Okay. Awesome. Does it work? Yeah. Cool. So, um, I guess we're getting started. Um, it's my job to kick this off. My name is Max Burgerhardt. Um, very warm welcome to you all. I'm really happy that you're not currently all the ball game or drinking beer already. So I appreciate it. Uh, we're going to spend about an hour, or a little less probably, talking about migrating existing Puppet environments, basically focus on Community Puppet, into Satellite 6. Uh, this is a very packed deck, so we're going to ask you politely to keep your questions until the end, but because if we start doing questions along the way, we'll probably never finish. So um, what we have in store for you today is uh, first an intro. So um, let me do that all over. Um, I'm Maxim Burgerhardt. I work as a solution architect for Red Hat EMEA from the Benelux region. Um, I focus mainly on Satellite 6 and Puppet in particular, so um, that's what I do. And I'm here with Chris Milstead and Rich Dorito. You guys want to do a little intro? Hi, Is everyone. I'm Chris. Uh, I work in the United Kingdom, um, or the country formerly known as the United Kingdom. God knows what's <laughs> happening there. Um, I work in the financial services sector, so I'm a solutions architect uh, across uh, a lot of the global uh, companies that we look after in Red Hat. And I'm Rich Dorito. I'm the technical marketing manager for Satellite Product Line. Uh, I'm based in the U.S. out of Pennsylvania. Uh, my primary goal is to enable these gentlemen to sell and build solutions on top of Satellite. And then their primary goal is to beat me up and tell me how much I can help them because my product sucks. <laughs> so that's basically how we work. Uh, I support yep. those guys in the field. Uh, they give me feedback from you guys as customers. And a lot of the feedback we uh, receive led into us creating this presentation. Okay. So. On to the agenda then. Um, what we're going to do first is give you a high level overview of what a migration from com Community Puppet, probably next to Satellite 5, would look if you bring everything to Satellite 6. We're going to talk about why you would want to do that in the first place. And after that, we're going to compare a couple of uh, concepts from Community Puppet to the native concepts we have in Satellite 6. And to be um, a little early with that, um, there is nothing ruled out. You can use those community concepts. You can use the native satellite concepts. Everything is fine, but you, make some, you need to make some choices, and that, what's for your, that is what we're going to talk about. Um, after that, we're going to talk about how to prepare uh, for such a migration. You can do uh, some tricks with uh, getting some visualization up front, and um, from there, we'll move to giving you some head starts, some scripts to start with um, to go into that actual migration after doing the preparing. So Chris and me are going to split up most of the presentation. Um, everything from here up to the migration choices is yours, so be my guest. Thank you, Max. So firstly, a bit of background. So um, kind of uh, to set the scene, we thought of about a scenario of what we thought people would probably be doing um, when they're moving to Satellite 6. Most people were hoping we'll still have Satellite 5 deployed. So Satellite 6 has now been out since September 2014. There was a configuration management capability within Satellite 5, but I think it's fair to say it was pretty rudimentary, and I'm not going to go into the details of that. But it wasn't very sophisticated. So one of the many, you know, much requested features, and kind of when you look at the kind of, kind of continuous deployment or you know, build everything from scratch, immutable infrastructure, people wanted a more sophisticated configuration management agent, and that, in you know, state of art. Back in 2014, that was Puppet, and that was basically baked into Satellite 6. Um, the other thing to say as well at the end of this is that we're going to talk about the concepts, and I think it's actually pretty simple to migrate a client that's being managed by a community Puppet and has been installed with Satellite 5 to migrate that wholly over to Satellite 6. The trick is kind of working out, and Max talks about it, is whether you want to do this kind of, I, I've been calling them in my brain loose coupling or tight coupling. So that's kind of the background, and what our goal is today is to kind of talk you through the two options, whether you stick with, you know, Art, NK, and Hira, if you're sophisticated Puppet users, or whether you actually use all the native smart variables and these capabilities within the native Satellite 6 product. Keep forgetting I've got a clicker. So, um, you know, I like pictures. So, picture says a thousand words. So, this is kind of our view of what, 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 what people just started with. You've got a Satellite 5, uh, you had a RAS from provisioning, and then you went, right, I want to do some more sophisticated configuration management. So, you know, as we do in all of our guides, we talk about Acme Corp, we talk about a hypothetical um, company. So, they, you know, using Satellite 5, they're doing some kickstarts, they've deployed servers. Now they want some more sophisticated configuration management. 
So they're going to deploy a puppet master. And in our scenario, the one we've walked through, the one we built all our labs and kind of testing around, we installed a puppet master, which was the same version as the one that's actually shipped in Satellite 6, so 3.8. We followed the, there's actually um, a, a puppet guide with Satellite 5, and there's some best practices. So we're saying you should still be following those, of course. So we're actually installing all of our modules in, in our case, Git, but any other um, source control version you've got. So our next step, we think to ourselves, right, well, we want to actually start migrating some of this stuff. So we're going to um, deploy Satellite 6. Um, it's worth taking a quick pause here and saying, I don't know if everyone remembers this, but um, if you want to um, migrate from Satellite 5 to Satellite 6, there is um, a transition uh, subscription you can apply for. So um, as Acme Corp has uh, found out about this, what you do, you go on so there's a web link, you can request access to this, and then you get all of your subscriptions, your satellite subscriptions and capsule or proxy subscriptions duplicated. So what we're going to do is we're going to stand up a satellite 6 server um, uh, side by side. And notice we've got some additional configuration, uh, some, sorry, some additional capabilities as well that's worth highlighting there. So we're going to start using the automated discovery plugin, and we're going to start making use of soon-to-be with the new 6.2 coming out at the end of July, uh, remote execution, and we're going to start making use of things like you know, integration with Red Hat Insights. We've shown this, so you might want to, at this point, scale out your satellite um, infrastructure, your Satellite 6 infrastructure. And now we're going to actually start getting into the migration. So we've deployed our Satellite uh, 6 server. We know it has inbuilt Puppet capability, and we now want to move our existing community puppet um, infrastructure into that Satellite 6 system. So first thing to point out is, he says pressing the wrong button that doesn't do the laser beam. There's an arrow. Ah! <laughs> spoiler <Don't look>. alert. <laughs> spoiler alert. Massive spoiler alert. That was an entire deck. I'll try and press one button at once. Ah, oh, I'm going to give up. So there's an arrow, which I can't point at because it won't let me, which goes between our puppet master to our... Um, to our Satellite 6 server. So the first step um, we're going on, our migra on, on this migration, this path, is to say we want to get some visibility of what's going on. And you know, raw output of log files is not very user friendly. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the puppet runs and all the information we get on that community puppet master, and we're going to forward that information into the Satellite 6 server. So we're going to start getting visual reports, and we're going to start seeing uh, changes and um, we've got some pictures and some um, when we actually walk through the migration afterwards we're going to actually show you some screenshots of what you should set up and what you should be looking out for and how you can check this is working so once we've got those reports the next thing we need to do is we need to duplicate those um, modules or the manifest files into satellite 6 uh, it's worth pointing out that at this stage you know satellite 6 is the external node um, classifier, classifier. <coughs> Sorry, pardon me, um, the external node classifier. So what we're going to do is we're going to bring those modules into Satellite 6. And at this point, we, the kind of the steps we're going to go through is how do we test that those modules, because we're going to use Satellite 6 to apply those modules to hosts now. How do we test that if we switch our configuration management from one side to the other, that exactly the same configuration is actually deployed on those servers? So we've got some you know, recommendations for how you should walk through, how you should test this before you do a bulk migration and end up with all of your hosts now managed and configured by Satellite 6. So that's kind of the, you know, why migrate? Because you're moving from Satellite 5 to Satellite 6. There's also some other benefits as well, which we need to remember as well, which is that Satellite 6 is shipped and fully supported. Um, as part of the, sat uh, sorry, Puppet is shipped and fully supported as part of the Satellite 6 product. Get my th words the right way around. So you're going to get, you know, you're going to be able to raise cases with Red Hat. You're going to be able to raise um, support cases. And um, uh, Red Hat will take care of all the, you know, feature functions, CVE vulnerabilities, all that sort of stuff for you. We're also going to have a single tool, and we're going to get a single unified report across RPM, Puppet content, and, you know, uh, Docker format containers and any other content we're managing now and you know other future content with Satellite 6. We're also going to have reporting on 
things like the configuration and you know, content views, we're going to be able to see a unified view of what our hosts are going. There's also the other bonuses as well, which we mentioned earlier, which are things like you know, new capabilities within Satellite 6, so insights, and also start to actually you know, use Satellite 6 to, to call the API to give us an API-driven provisioning process. So that's kind of a quick overview of our what we're going to show and what we're going to walk through and kind of the pictures to show what we're going to try and take you through. The key to getting this right and the key to making this successful and picking the right strategy, this loose or tight coupling, is to kind of look at, at the detail of what, you know, the puppet terminology and the satellite terminology. So I'm going to hand over to Max now and he's going to take you through kind of a guide to these two things and give you kind of recommendations of what we think are the best ways to do it. Awesome. So before we start into this, um, to, to gauge the audience a little bit, can, can I get a raise of hands from people that are using Satellite 5 and Community Puppet together right now? So it's still quite a few. So we got the right audience. That's that yes. good to know. Um, so what I'm going to go through with you is um, a couple of concepts that we're going to um, basically put against each other and try and, if, try and see if we, get, if we can get some pros and cons from both. And the, the main topics I want to cover here right now are uh, things like lifecycle management for your modules with something like R10K or the satellite native version of uh, the lifecycle management, which is content views. We're going to talk about building blocks, building, uh, building blocks for, for technical purposes, which are uh, called profiles in Community Puppet often, and the satellite native um, equivalent, which would be a config group. We're going to talk about roles, which is um, a bundle of profiles again, so it's a bit of a higher level bundling, a little higher level of abstraction to build a system's definition, as opposed to host groups. And finally, we're going to talk about high rise versus smart parameters. And again, I want to point out, neither of these is something that should be exclusively done for, Puppet Enter for, for uh, Community Puppet or for Satellite 6. All can work in Satellite 6. You can use R10K with Satellite 6. You can use Hire with, with Satellite 6. But it's about, as Chris said, making the right choices that work for you. Okay. So the first thing we're going to talk about is um, environments, or at least lifecycle management of your modules through the concept of environments. So who knows what an environment is in Puppet terms? OK, that is not as many as I hoped. <laughs> so I'm going to do a little recap of what an environment is. So in the most basic form, an environment is just a directory on your Puppet Master that holds Puppet modules. Um, you can use those directories to form a chain of environments you use to promote changes through. So basically, you create an environment called dev, you create one called test, you create one called prod, and you um, basically take the changes you make in dev, put them in testing, have someone test them, and if they're tested, you take those changes and you move them to production. That is what environments are very often used for. There are some other uses for them, but I think this is probably the main use case. So the trick is, how do I get a tool to do that environment management in the best possible way? So that is what R10K and Content Views are about. They're managing those environments. So from the people that um, said, I know what an environment is, how many of you are using R10K at this point? Anything else? What are you using right now? Can I get a shout from someone? Subversion, OK. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Because there are a couple of other alternatives. You can do Git submodules. You can do Puppet Librarian, which are basically functionally more or less the same as R10K. This is what we see most used in EMEA, so in Europe where I'm from. So this is what we focused on. Um, basically, what R10K does, <laughs> it takes a Git repository, and it, it maps each branch in that repository to an environment. And it can deploy an environment based on the contents of that branch. And what is in that branch is what you see here. This, oh, yeah, I have the same problem as Chris, so I'm not going to use that. So the left box here is the contents of something called a puppet file. And a puppet file basically lists all of your modules with their versions. And when you invoke the R10K command, it will read that puppet file from each branch and deploy a directory, what you see on the right. Uh, with all the modules you, you, you're asking for. Now, those modules basically probably come from either Puppet Forge or your local Git server. It doesn't really matter. But by putting that uh, Puppet file in Git, you're creating a versioned um, method of moving changes from one environment to another. Bas basically, you merge the change you do in development into testing. And if it's tested, you merge that change into production. Does that make sense? Great. So you can do this. 
with Satellite 6, and we actually have customers that do this. We do not support ArcMK itself, but we do support importing of existing environments. So that should work fairly well. I'll talk about that a little bit later. So another way of managing those environments is by using content views. And a content view is a native concept in Satellite 6 that is um, easiest to compare with uh, a database view. So who, who knows what a database view is? A uh, little more, okay. <laughs> We're going to step back. Um, a content view is basically a filtered set of content. So if you, uh, to, to, go, to go on with the database analogy, if you take a database table, if you, or you take two database tables, you can put a view on those tables and only show parts of what is in those tables. And that is exactly what a content view does. If you layer them on top of uh, RPM repositories, for example, you can include filters to only show the RPMs you want to be in that content view. And it works the same way for Puppet modules. So basically what you do, you know, you guys know Puppet Forge, probably you've written Puppet codes, so you know Puppet Forge. Puppet Forge runs on Pulp, which is a component of Satellite as well. So you can push your modules into Satellite 6, and Satellite 6 will know about your modules, and in the Satellite interface, you can then add your modules to a content view. You can do it through the web interface, or through the command line interface, or through the API, that doesn't really matter. It's easy, um, easy, easily scriptable. But the point is, if you have created a content view, you press a big button that says publish, Satellite creates a content view for you, and what happens under the hood is that Satellite creates an environment, and that works in the exact same way as it would do with R10K. So how does that work? The screenshots look better than I expected, by the way. <laughs> That's pretty That's nice. Good. Can you read this? Like five meters from the screen? <laughs> That's awesome. So you go into Satellite Interface, you go to the, to the content view management page, you get to create a new content view, and from there, you just add all the modules you want to be in there. Then you press the upper big blue button, and it creates the content view and thus the environment for you. The trick here is to tell Satellite to always use the latest version of your modules, because as you push in new versions of the modules you write by yourself, you just republish. You don't have to change anything here. You just republish, and it will take the newest version of the module automatically. So that's fairly simple. As we're talking about content views, though, um, and I don't know how many of you are familiar with Satellite 6, only a few. So there is a document called the 10 steps to an SOE with uh, Satellite 6, which is hugely thick, but it describes fairly well what the choices are you can make if you start setting up laying out content views. And I want to go through those choices a little bit because it makes sense to know, you know we, we're trying to make a choice between doing the native puppet concepts and the native satellite concepts, but there's a choice in native satellite concepts as well. So let's go through those. The first thing we can do is we can create one really big monolithic all-in-one content view. So that's a content view I add everything to. So it's RPMs, puppet modules, Docker images, OS3 content, whatever. Everything goes in one content view. So the good part about that is that you get everything together, which means that if you've developed that in development and then promoted it to testing, and everything works in testing, promoting it to production will automatically mean everything will work in production because everything has already been tested together. So it's one immutable block. Um, if you look at, let's give you a little bit of a, we're all mostly guys, so images help. Um, <laughs> What we can do in Satellite is define a life cycle path. So that's what you see in the top. It's development, testing, production. Each life cycle environment is coupled to a host group. And for now, let's just say a host group is a group of systems. So not, let's not make it too complicated. And then we have three versions of the same content view, versions three, two, and one. Version three is the newest one. It's been developed right now. Version two is in testing. We have already done development. Development is done. We're testing it. It works. And what is in production right now is version one. And we have big blocks that have RPMs and puppet modules in one content view. OK? Stay. So the downside of this is if you promote that really big content view, that is going to take a little time. Because there might be 25,000 RPMs in there. And we need to do some computation, computation around that. So that's going to take a little while. And if you are in the beginning of your Puppet implementation, so the guys that already use Puppet probably know, if you're in the beginning of your implementation, you want to have some development speed that slows down after a while. But in the beginning, as you're implementing Puppet, you, ha you want to have um, fast turnaround in development. So that might not be ideal if you're starting off with Puppet. Another slight downside is that if you have a content view for L6 and one for L7, you need to add the same modules to both content views. So you need to do management on those modules in two places. If you want to take one out, you need to do it two times. 
Um, that last part we can fairly simply circumvent by um, making something we call a composite content view, which is not a content view that is based out of RPMs and puppet modules, but a content view that is based out of content views. Very good. Um, the good part is we now have one dedicated puppet content view that we can reuse in different um, other content views we create, other composite content views. But the downside is that we haven't fixed the problem around publication and promotion yet, because that is still going to be, you know, that's still going to take a little time. Um, to make it a little bit more visual again, this is mostly the same picture, but now it says composite content view, and instead of having RPMs and modules in that same big box, I have now two boxes, one for puppet modules, one for RPMs. Still with me? Still awake? Cool. The third option is to create a dedicated puppet content view, but we're going to use or maybe abuse a little bit or be creative with the fact that puppet, that Satellite is going to create a, an environment from this module. So what we can do is we're going to let, um, we, put, we put all of our puppet modules in one content view, we publish it, we promote it to development or testing or whatever, and Satellite will have created an environment from this. And we're going then to assign that environment to our systems directly without the content view, promotion, and, and publication in between. And that's going to be a lot faster, okay? I'll show a little screenshot about how that works later on. Um, but there is a little, little downside to this. You're, you're now detaching RPMs from Puppet modules, so you won't have that single immutable thing anymore that you can easily move from testing to production and be sure that it won't you know, do anything unexpected because um, you haven't tested it together necessarily. Um, that would look like this. So you would have a content view, version three in development, and I might have version 25 of the content view that I use to create my environment with. You know, that can, that, that can move into completely different speeds. I have a slow moving content view with RPMs, and I can have a very fast moving content view, or actually the environment that goes with it, um, that I use for puppet modules. So I have two different speeds. How do I do this? Um, this is the screen in Satellite that allows me to assign a content view to either a group of systems or a single system, doesn't really matter, same screen. Um, and as you see in the upper, upper red box there, I'm adding a content view to this uh, system or group of systems called CCV RHEL 7 Puppet Master 3.8. It doesn't, the title doesn't really matter. Then I have a second drop-down menu called Puppet Environment. And there you see in the drop-down environment, in the, in the drop-down menu, you see all kinds of names of environments that Satellite has created based on other content views. So I can just use one of those. And if, I've, you know, if I put all of my, my modules in a dedicated content view, like uh, CV Puppet Modules, I can use that environment as uh, my environment for all of my systems. And that speeds up development fairly um, radically. So, and then there's the final option. Um, we're gonna, not going to stand still too long with this one, but um, I talked about the environment based on the content view earlier. You can also import an existing environment that you have on disk, an environment that is managed through R10K or Subversion or Git submodules or a puppet librarian, that doesn't really matter. And you can import that environment into Satellite 6 so you get the visibility on the classes that are in that environment and you can assign the classes through the Satellite interface. So what you see here is an imported environment and that environment is not managed through Satellite, or the life cycle of that environment is not managed through Satellite. It's actually managed through a source control management system and is then uh, based on branches in, the, in, for example, Git. And we do the life cycle management through merges between the different branches. Everything works. The choice is up to you to see what fits your deployment and your organization best. So let's do a little <coughs> recap so you have all the pros and cons uh, set together. Um, you, want to keep, you might want to keep using R10K, and that's fine. Again, it does require the installation of R10K on your satellite server and on your capsules, and it has a couple of caveats. So you want to go to the satellite blog there. Uh, we wrote a little post that explains how to install R10K on your satellite server. Again, we do not support R10K itself, but we, we, we support the whole workflow around it fine. Um, there's very little work to migrate, but um, this is not accessible through the Satellite API, and if we, who, who was at the Satellite and Ansible together session earlier today? Only three, so we announced today that Satellite eventually will do Ansible as well, and using R10K is fairly Puppet only, so that might or might not matter for you. If you want to migrate to using Puppet modules, I mentioned that you need to push your modules into Satellite, into a repository in Satellite. Um, that sounds like a lot of work, but it actually it's not that bad. We have a script for that called Pamsu that's written by a colleague of ours uh, that you can just point at a directory with modules and it will push everything into a certain repository in Satellite and it's you know, done. 
Um, so you need to pick a content view model that matches your way of working, either one of the, the three I showed before. And you can do everything from there with either the command line interface, the web interface, or the, um, the API. So it's all scriptable fairly easily. Um, the good part here is you can now see what happens in the satellite interface. You, so you get visibility and you get a, the, the ability to drive everything from a higher level orchestration platform like, for example, CloudForms, if you, will, if you would want to. It does, however, require you to work a little different than what you're used to. Okay. On to the next one. So this is actually me talking about roles and profiles together. I'm not going to split that up. Um, doesn't make any sense, really. Uh, who knows what roles and profiles are? Okay. okay, that's good. So for the people that don't know, um, back when I started doing Puppet, which is like five or six, maybe even more years ago, it was fairly common to just take one node and add all of the classes to it. And that is fine if you have like five systems or so, but if you have 500, th that starts sucking pretty badly and pretty rapidly. So what people started doing at some point is to create wrappers around modules, to create building blocks, basically, that you can then stick together um, in, in much less code and make reusable. So we have two. There's the profile, which is a technical building block, which, which you see in the, in the bottom left corner there, which wraps together things like, uh, for in, this, in this example, things like a hardening um, class and an NTP class to form a technical building block that is for you, the sysapp. And then together, a couple of those profiles form a role. For example, the role web server, which you see in, a, in the top left there, which means something to your, your customer or your business. So you build from technical building blocks, you build more business-driven wrappers to all, for, for all of your classes to make it easier to assign those classes to your systems. Um, so in Satellite, we have more or less the same concept. Um, let me go back there. Often roles and profiles are implemented in dedicated classes. So you can use those classes fine. If you import them into Satellite, you can use them fine. But we have something that is very similar in the web interface, which would be API-driven then again. You can use that from another tool if you want to um, you know, basically orchestrate satellite from a higher level. Um, the, the equivalent to a profile is called a config group, which is almost exactly the same as a profile. We create a technical building block, we add classes to the technical building block, and then we don't add the individual classes to a system, but we add the config group to a system. So we add all of the classes together. What do we add them to? We add them to a host group, which is very similar to what a role is. It defines what a system needs to do to be useful for you. So basically, this is the screen that shows you um, the, the, the configuration of a host group. And what you see there is an available config group called WordPress. And there's one already included called base config that basically configures this doesn't work, so let's not. That configures the, base conf the, the basics of the operating system. And then if we add the other one, it would completely configure um, the system to be a WordPress server. So we add multiple classes at the same time. It's very similar to how roles and profiles work in, in, in many cases. Um, it needs to be said here, though, that um, a role is really only a bundle of classes, whereas a host group does a lot more than adding classes to a group of systems. Um, a role is also uh, responsible for um, allowing content to RPMs, for example, um, where does a system need to be deployed, what kind of IP address range can I use. So it's, it's a much broader definition of what a system should look like than just the role. Um, taking a step back, uh, do a little recap here. Um, roles and profiles, it's really easy to migrate because you've done everything already. And that's, that's fairly easy to, to set up. You just import the class and you're done. Uh, the downside, though, is that if you import the role classes, you have no idea at that point anymore what actual classes are added to your systems because it's all invisible from that point. Um, so you cannot manage that from something like CloudForms. It would become, at least become very difficult. If you want to migrate to using config groups and host groups, um, it's not really that much work, but it is work that you need to do. You need to create those config groups to match what you were doing in profiles, and you need to create the host groups, or at least configure the host groups, to match what you were doing in the roles. So there's a little work involved. After you've done that, though, you get complete visibility and complete usability and, and the ability to orchestrate everything from a higher level orchestration tool. And you get visibility in the API uh, and, and in the UI. On to parameters. And this is probably the most debated part of Puppet. How do I pass parameters to my systems next to lifecycle management? Um, back when I started doing Puppet, it was fairly common to set variables at the global level. Um, but in most programming languages, global variables are frowned upon. So at some point, Puppet started using um, 
class parameters, which are not global, which are, which are scoped to a single class. Usually, if you look at community puppet, what is used to pass those parameters which influence the behavior of a class, um, to, to pass those parameters to a class is something called Hira. Who's familiar with Hira? Okay, that's fantastic. I don't have to explain that. Um, but I'm gonna do it anyway. Hira <laughs> is a system to, to um, set up basically a hierarchy of files and Puppet is going to look through that hierarchy of files for a certain key. And the moment it finds that key, it's going to read the value that belongs to the key and pass that value to your class. So in the example here, I have a very simple hierarchy, FQDN domain environment common. Um, everything that starts with the strange uh, percentage and then curly brace um, into two colons is a variable. So what Hira is going to do is going to look for a file with the name of my system, FQDN and it's gonna look for that key. If it doesn't find it, it's going to look for a file with the name of the domain my system's in. If it, done, if it doesn't find that file, it's gonna fall through to environment, et cetera. Common is where the defaults live. So the common is what you see here. Um, this works fine in Satellite. We ship Hira as part of Satellite 6, so if you wanna use Hira, it's fully supported. Um, there's not a reason why um, this you know, shouldn't be, be part of your infrastructure, basically. However, um, if you have junior people in your environment, Hira can be a little, um, let's call it daunting. Is that the proper English word? I think yeah. so, yeah. <laughs> it can be a little um, difficult to grasp the full set of environment, uh, the full set of parameters that are available to a certain system and um, what the reasons are um, why certain parameters are chosen for a certain system. So what Satellite uh, built in is uh, the system called Smart Parameters which is very similar, again, to what Hira does, but it does it in the UI. So you get the set uh, matchers, which basically Satellite looks for the name of a system, um, you know, FQDN is whatever my name is the system, and the value, and you can define a value that uh, corresponds to, for example, a host name or a domain, just like in Hira. The big difference between smart parameters and Hira, uh, let's put them together, is that Hira is something that lives in Git, which might be daunting for your junior admin, but it is in Git, so you can version everything, and um, in some cases, that is really useful. However, Hira lives completely outside of the Satellite 6 world, so you get zero visibility of all your parameters inside that single web interface, which we talked about, which would be the single pane of glass management tool for, 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 for all intents and purposes, and you know, you're not seeing your variables. Um, so I think that, that is the main distinction. Um, Smart parameters are basically solving that problem of not being able to see your parameters. However, there is still a roadmap item to be fulfilled around putting your smart parameters in some kind of versioning system. So it's, it's trade-off between visibility and putting stuff in Git. And you need to pick what is most important for you. I have customers that do either one. I have customers that do both. So you can use Hira to set up a layer of defaults. And you can have your senior admins manage the Hira layer and then expose only certain parameters to your junior admins or to your end customers to override certain variables only. So you get best of both worlds. However, that um, is understandably comes with uh, a little bit more complexity. You have variables now in two places. Can you save the question till the end, please? Because um, I think we're already running out of time. I don't know what time it is. Anyway, um, what I re really didn't really mention yet is that Hira has one hierarchy for everything. In, form, or in satellite, you can have a hierarchy for each parameter by itself. So each parameter can have its own hierarchy. If you're migrating from Hira to Satellite 6, you probably want to set the default hierarchy in Satellite to something that is very close to what you were using in Hira to make that migration a little easier. So to do that, you just go into settings, you go to the puppet tab, you go to a, um, a menu item that is called default variables lookup path, and you basically set up a, a similar hierarchy that you were using in Hira and then port over your variables. I haven't written this script yet, but it should be fairly simple to write a script that goes through your Hira hierarchy, reads all of your keys, and pushes all the values in Satellite. Um, but in all honesty, I haven't gotten around to that yet. Um, so the final one, and this is not a long story for Satellite, but it, it, it needs to be mentioned for Community Puppet, I think, is how do I attach that, that role that I defined to a system? because a role by itself doesn't mean anything. It needs to be applied to a system to actually do something. Um, most of the time, I think in most Puppet deployments, you will use something for that called a site manifest, which is a text file that lists all of your systems and says, this system, that role, this system, that role, this system, that role. Um, 
If you move to Satellite 6, there's actually nothing extra you need to do. If you're using host groups, your, the host group membership will automatically apply all of the classes that are assigned to the host group to your system. So this is fairly easy. There's not a lot of work in this part of the migration. And I think I'm getting back to you almost, Chris. Um, this is for you back home. If you're downloading this deck right after you have a little bit of a, a reference diagram that you can see the different mappings and different concepts as, as they're compared to each other. Okay, back to you, Chris. Thank you. So now um, we've kind of looked at the two kind of the loose and the tight coupling. We might decide that we're going to go, you know, we want to keep our, our complete R10K workflow in place. We're going to um, uh, use Hira. We're going to keep everything kind of very external and just import these modules from the file system into satellite. Or we might decide we're going to move completely over to, to the satellite workflow. We're going to use smart parameters. We're going to use config groups. Uh, we're going to use these dual um, content views, and we're going to have a different environment potentially um, for our puppet modules as if we were for our RPM content. So we've been through that, we've made our decisions, and we base that about how our business actually wants to work, about whether our modules change fast or slow, and we, we make some sensible choices. So now we're going to actually do the migration. We're just going to point out a couple of things first about compatibility. Um, so I, I dread to ask this question. So everyone knows when the end of life for Rail 5 is? March next year? Yeah. How many people have got Rail 5 deployed in, in production? <coughs> yes! <laughs> How many people have got Rail 4? Yes! Rail 3? Yes! <laughs> two winners! Well, I'm, I'm, not going any, two? I'm not going any further back. <laughs> I'm, not doing it. I'm not doing it. <laughs> All right. Okay. I always love asking that. Um, so, you know, at the, we're aiming this mainly at six and seven. Um, you shouldn't hit many issues there, but just note that the, rel, the version of Puppet in RHEL 5 because of the versions of Ruby and stuff. So the sooner you can get rid of them, the better, please. Um, and satellite, the, the, the modules. Um, so generally, it just works. Um, the only uh, issue we sometimes see is... A defined type. Say that again. It's a defined type. Defined types, yes. Yeah. <laughs> there is a way around it. Um, there's a link here to a resource that uh, Steve Benjamin wrote, which basically uh, kind of iterates through this and kind of um, instantiates these rather than kind of calling them. So if you do hit an error, generally that's the issue. Um, go and have a look at some of the K bases and stuff. They're, it's all written up on there. Um, but Satellite 6 is an external node classifier. So Generally, everything just works because um, the external node classifier kind of uh, interface is well-defined and fairly static. So let's go through the steps. We've decided what we're going to do. The first thing we want to do is say, right, we've got an existing host um, or existing set of hosts against an existing puppet master. We want to know what's going on because if we don't have these you know, visibility, we're not going to get very far. We're going to see log files. It's going to be a nightmare to debug. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to get the reports uh, from the existing Puppet Master, and we're going to forward them onto the Satellite 6 server. And Max has very fantastically written a script which kind of goes through all the stuff. There are some SSL certificates and things that you have to import, and then there is a, um, a report forwarder which you can get from um, the Puppet site. So you need to basically import those two things, but the script kind of goes through all that, and we've got some links at the end for that. So what you're going to see, uh, here's a very bad Puppet module that someone's run. You look at the bottom, and you see the number of events, and you see that every 30 minutes, our Puppet module is making a change. Who would write a Puppet module to update the message of the day to put the timestamp into the message of the day? So immediately you can see that we've got a problem with that Puppet module, something's gone wrong, we've got visible reports. So this is the first step we're recommending. Get these in because you know, these pictures are much easier to look at than going through the logs for all the servers and stuff. Um, the other thing as well, you've got, uh, if everyone's you know, played around with the Puppet functionality in Satellite 6 or playing around with the beta, of course, at the moment, um, you've also got all the diffs and all kind of the actual, you know, this is what I actually did, this is the change I made. It's much easier to kind of do this in the UI than it is to go around a number, you know, 100 different servers or look through log files and try and figure out individual hosts in there. So that's our first step, get the reports in. Now the migration itself. Um, we've actually got a script to do all of this, which we're going to kind of get to in a couple of slides. So don't worry that I'm kind of glossing over kind of the individual steps, but 
we've all scripted that for you. And actually, Max has also written a remote execution command. So if you are going to be moving to Satellite 6.2, you could do this all remotely. Ooh. Um, so the first step, you want to back up your client. So uh, we want to capture something that will give us an easy, um, quick indication, this classes.txt file, to see if we start applying Puppet modules from satellite server, do I get the same classes actually implemented on the box? Um, and did I put it in the right host group? Because that's obviously the first test. Um, the actual switchover, we've scripted it. It's kind of very simple. Um, assuming you used RPM to install the community Puppet agent, it's very simply just removing the RPMs for the community Puppet agent and then deploying the RPMs for the um, Red Hat supplied satellite um, Puppet agents onto the box. Um, the other thing just to point out is that normally when a new Puppet um, uh, agent runs, the first thing it'll do is it'll, it'll um, create SSL certificate to um, uh, protect that communication. And normally we recommend not to set auto sign on the Satellite 6 server. This means that people can't start firing up millions of uh, Puppet agents or connect systems you don't want talking to um, your Satellite 6 server. So um, what we recommend is that when we're doing the bolt migration, we turn that on to auto sign, but for now just, uh, you know, just t uh, pick a couple of test systems and use them and sign them manually. You can, of course, also do the you know, no-op runs with your Puppet agent just to see what's going on and check you know, the actual reports on the boxes. Once you're happy with your first system, your test systems, you've kind of been through the process, it's time to press that big red button. So bolt migration. And as I was saying, we've got a link at the bottom there. Um, uh, so there's a new uh, uh, Red Hat satellite. Uh, a lot of kind of the stuff that... Um, essays, consultants, customers, business unit, customers, uh, all, all the content we're generating. We're trying to put it all in this um, uh, location here in this GitHub. So there's a lot of uh, interesting and cool content there you can go and grab. So um, we've put all the stuff we've developed as part of this, and Max has done most of it on, on the remote execution stuff, um, is actually in there. So um, it kind of goes through the steps. We're going to disable existing repos. We're going to remove the existing RPMs. We need the satellite tools, because as everyone knows, from 6.1 onwards, that's where we get our Puppet Agent from now. And then we're going to install the Red Hat Provide Puppet Agents. And then when we're doing a bolt migration, make sure that you go through and set your capsule certificates to auto sign. Otherwise, you're going to have lots of buttons to click and press or lots of API calls to make to, um, auto to sign those certificates. And that's very kind of the migration process is very simple. The key to this all is just going through kind of the different tight and loose coupling ways and working out the best pattern and the best way to use satellite functionality and puppet functionality to fit the way you're being asked to actually operate. If you've got fast moving uh, puppet modules and you need to do puppet development at a very, very rapid f pace and you want to integrate it all into satellite, that example where we showed where we've got a, you know, a, a kind of we manually decide to have a different you know, version 25 of our content view, which is our puppet content, you know, versus version three of our RPM content. Maybe you've got like a six month or three month patching cycle for our RPM content. So that's kind of, that's the key to getting this right. The migration's actually fairly simple generally. So I'm gonna hand back to Max, who's gonna kind of summarize all yeah. the steps and then we're gonna open up for questions. Sure, how, how are we in time? Go for 10 minutes. Yeah, you got okay. 15. Cool. Awesome. But you're all between them and beer. Remember that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'll, be, I'll be brief. So um, I'm not going to cover all of this, but I hope we have been able to provide you with at least some, some good background information you can base your own choices on. Uh, we've covered, I think, a lot of the why. I think we've covered a lot of the how as well. I, mean, I think we covered a lot of the choices you need to make, so I hope that at least helps. Um, going um, grab those scripts from the GitHub Chris mentioned because that is the place where you start writing your own. A lot of the work has already been done for you. Um, and we have, you know, keep in mind that the recommendation Chris made about the visibility is, is a pretty important one. It, it makes a lot of sense to know upfront what is going on and then compare it to after the migration than to just getting those reports after the migration and bas basically be flabbergasted about the reports you're getting in because you just didn't know. Um, Having said that, I'm not going to read through the whole summary. Um, these are the GitHub links you want to go to. The top one is where our scripts are. 
And then we have the pump shoe script that I really want to mention explicitly here. I, I have no idea if Morgan's here, I've never met him, but Morgan Weedman wrote this brilliant script to push all of your Puppet modules into Satellite 6. The PDF will be up in like five minutes after this. So um, if you go to github.com slash Red Hat Satellite, you need to take the space out manually because this presentation program is doing kind, a head in. kind of strangely <laughs> inserting that space all the time. Um, you get a lot of scripts for this specific task, the migration, but also for all kinds of other things like automatic promotion of content views if you have uh, composite content views and things like that. And then uh, the final link we have here is the direct link to the article around implementing R10K on your satellite server. Take a look at that if it helps you, if you want to do that. And uh, basically, go and get started in your migration. That would be my, uh, my recommendation here. I think we open up for questions now. Yep, I just have one shameless plug for GitHub, okay? <laughs> because I'm the marketing guy, so I have to actually say something in this presentation. Uh, so the satellite organization and GitHub exists to, uh, go back on that link. Uh, the satellite organization exists in GitHub so that we can kind of consolidate all of the random things that we have worked on uh, that kind of sit outside of the product development cycle. So there are things there such as, you know, these scripts, uh, migration scripts, uh, inventory scripts, all kinds of stuff that Red Hatters have wrote, kind of our own little pet projects. Uh, we have a couple projects there that came from some of our customers who we've worked with and they open sourced their code, which is actually really awesome. Uh, and then we also have you know, contributions from various other contributors who've written stuff on top of Satellite. So there's all kinds of stuff there, not just that. I think within like two days of opening up the GitHub organization, we had like 10 or so contributions. It was actually pretty huge. Uh, so that we kind of curate that. We know that, uh, you know, as, as an end user, you want to make sure that stuff is kind of well curated and it's going to work for you. And that's really kind of our, our requirements for joining, right? So if you have or develop something on your own that uh, runs against Satellite 6, we're, we're welcome to host it for you. Okay, all we ask is that you maintain it and respond to pull requests when needed. Okay, that's what I got. <laughs> okay, I think there was a question. I think you were very, very soon with your question, so. Do you have a, a microphone? For him? Okay. Well, we'll repeat the question then. Yeah. I'll just repeat. Sound off, brother. <laughs> So I think, so do just, you want to just, repeat the question? So, is the, is it, yeah. is the, so the, your, your question was, if I make changes in Hira, do I see them reflected in the transaction log in Satellite? Yeah. So, so if, you make a, if, you, if you just use smart variables and you change a smart variable, is that captured in the Satellite audit log? Yes. And the answer is yes. That is. And so we, you get an we, audit we log. We the user, timestamp, and I believe the previous value. Yeah. Either previous value or value. Well, we know what value changed. I think we tagged previous yeah. value. So what we don't have is that whole history and whole long version control that you would get from Git at the moment. We don't have that's a Git something that, That's something <laughs> that's being worked on, yeah. That's you. That's my question. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we brought Rich. I this presentation <laughs> for that here. question. <laughs> All right. So the, the, the question that he asked was, I am a Puppet 3 user. When is Red Hat going to release Puppet 4? And will we have a transition strategy for our 3 to 4? So as mentioned earlier in this presentation, Satellite 6.1 is based on 3.6. Satellite 6.2 is based on 3.8. We are looking to release Puppet 4 as part of Satellite 6.3. Okay, so in our next release, that's what we're looking for. Uh, this becomes challenging with us because Satellite has a whole bunch of components that are, one, dependent upon Puppet, and two, we have some particularly large satellite customer. So what it looks like we're going to do in 6.3, well, we will uh, deliver 4 and 3 in parallel uh, because we understand that not everyone's going to want to go to 4 immediately, uh, but it will be an install time option. So you'll be able to install a capsule or satellite with four or install it with three. So that, that's our plan for the near term. Cool. That's my one useful thing. I'm, I'm, I'm leaving now. <laughs> yes, sir.
No, it does not. So, so just, just to repeat the question. The okay, question. I'll, I'll repeat it. So the, the question was, we have folks who are currently wanting to, uh, are currently using Community Puppet uh, or Puppet not shipped by Red Hat. Uh, and we just gave you a presentation on how to move from that into Puppet and Satellite. Is that all for nothing because now an Ansible's coming? That, does that summarize your question? All right, so with regards to our strategy, we're going polyglot with inside of Satellite 6. So our strategy is if you are a Puppet user, we will support Puppet for the near term. We, if you're an Ansible user, we will support that too. Okay, so you, we will treat both Puppet and Ansible as first class citizens inside of Satellite 6. So we acquired Ansible, we're going to integrate their technology into Satellite in some form or fashion. You will see that, but we are also not abandoning our investment in, in Puppet. I can't even tell you my roadmap for the next six months and you're asking me 18 months out. But no, ser seriously, all, all jokes aside, uh, we, have, we have no long-term plans to uh, eliminate Puppet from the product. Yeah. We, we've got some very large customers who are, you know, their strategy is Puppet through and through, so it's, yeah, it'll be around as long as there's demand for it. Yes. Yep. Different story. Diff it's, so a, it's, a, it's a different set of steps, so I'll repeat the question. Uh, how does this migration and integration strategy work if you are using Puppet Enterprise? Okay, so if you're using uh, a tool such as Puppet Enterprise, uh, one of the big challenges that we deal with is that, uh, at least until recently, uh, they actually shipped a different, completely different version of the Puppet agent uh, than, than the community bits. So the, the joy of this workflow is that we're using the community bits, which are the, basically the same thing that the Red Hat bits are based off of. So as long as you line up the version numbers, you, you're usually pretty okay. Uh, in the case of Puppet Enterprise, this solution may work to some extent, but I think there's probably better ways to do that, right? Because if you have Puppet Enterprise, what you've said is, I'm going to do things with Puppet Enterprise, I'm going to use their node classifier, I'm going to manage my systems, maybe I use some of their, like their, their apps, like the Puppet Code Manager and all that other stuff. If you're using it in that scenario, we have a reference architecture for Satellite 6.1 that I worked on uh, with my compadre over at uh, Puppet Labs, which basically shows the two solutions kind of side by side. And what we do in that scenario is kind of different architecturally, right? So in this scenario, what you effectively start off with is you have a community Puppet Master that reports things into Satellite 6, right? In the Puppet Enterprise plus Sat6 scenario, your Puppet Master still report to Puppet Enterprise. And Puppet Enterprise, using a custom plugin, reports to Satellite's API, all your Puppet reports data. So you still can support the two side by side, but it's a different workflow than what we presented today. So, so there was a presentation last year at Summit, so there's a whole set of, there's a whole deck that Rich presented, which has got all of these um, slides through. So if you look for last year's Summit presentations, you can find a whole kind of deck outlining this whole, all the steps and how that works. So you can look in last year's Summit or last year's Puppet Conf, because we presented it at both. We'll take this gentleman. He was, he was, his hand went up real early. Got it. Uh, regarding the content to promotion, uh, does it work more like the Arctic Gateway or the crossing that you need to support? Because if you use the Arctic Gateway, you have a disruption mm -hmm. to deploy your environment. And with the crossing, it's uh, not that. So, running get the good question. I would have checked that. I don't know. Sure. So the question was whether um, the content view promotion way of mo doing lifecycle management for the modules was closer to um, R10K or what is used in Puppet 4 called if the, the file sync way of, of doing, doing the lifecycle management or at least the deployment of the environment. And I honestly, I don't have an answer. I need to look that up. So, good one. Sorry. Over there. Yeah, absolutely. It shouldn't. To, um, Repeat the question. So th this question was, I already have an existing working Puppet 4 environment. I want to introduce Satellite for all the other things that Satellite does, content, uh, you know, software errata, uh, access insights, all that other good yeah. stuff. Uh, how do I do that? So the, the answer is yes, you can. Uh, one of the things that you will, uh, actually two things you'd have to do uh, at a high level. One of which is our provisioning templates in Satellite 6 are wired to install the Puppet agent that we ship. So if you have your own, you'd have to customize those, okay? And ensure that we don't deploy ours and we deploy yours. Uh, the other thing that's important is that, uh, you know, you, if, if possible, uh, 
have your, uh, your Puppet Master's report fact and report data to the satellite just so that we keep a fresh inventory. But outside of that, because that's effectively what we do in a, uh, we do that, that's effectively what we do with, with Puppet Enterprise, is we turn off community Puppet that we ship, or support a community Puppet, and deploy our agents and ensure that we get uh, fact and report data back. There's one thing I would want to add to that, is the fact that if you use your, your external Puppet cluster, that should work fine. I don't see any interference, but you're losing out on things like OpenSCAP and Reddit Insights automatically because that, re that requires um, the usage of the Puppet that is in satellite, or it doesn't require it, but it, it's the way it's set up normally. So you would have to do that yourself. There's, yeah. There's a little bit of roll your own yeah. if, you, uh, if you want to deploy SCAP or Insights. Insights. Uh, one of the things that they, the, module, the Puppet modules that we have for SCAP and Insights assume certain parameters are going to be sent by satellite since satellites function in that ENC role. So if you were to use uh, a different Puppet infrastructure, you still can use those modules to set up, uh, to set up those functions, uh, SCAP and Insights. However, you're going to have to manually supply those class parameters because they won't come down automatically from the ENC. Will that be the integration If you wanted to kind of clone this for a community puppet for that would probably be the, the best thing to look at. That gentleman over there. So, yeah, can you put can you put it back to? Uh, so I actually have one customer in. Um, I'm from Holland, so I, um, we, we do Benelux. So we have a Belgian customer. Repeat the question. Uh, I'm sorry. Good point. So the question is, if we have, um, if we're moving into using Puppet and we are, we use that. Uh, the, the method of doing the rapid deployment of the modules with uh, using the environment, the, the environment that the content view creates. Um, how do I go from there to doing a, a, a bundled content view, so the composite content view, um, because my, my puppet environment is maturing? So I actually have a customer in Belgium that deploys, that uses that um, sp this specific method. They, they have the environment created by by Satellite uh, based on the content view, and they assign this to their testing systems. And then after testing, they make this. Uh, this content view a part of a composite content view and put that in production. So this actually, that is being deployed in production right now. So that works, okay? Yeah, the, the only thing you gotta remember is that a system can belong to exactly one content view. So effectively what you're gonna end up doing is on your development uh, host groups, you'll have your RPM content view and your dedicated puppet environment defined. But on your test and production, uh, host groups, you'll have that composite content view defined, and the puppet environment would be the one that matches that composite. Yeah. Can, every, can everybody, hear, everybody hear the question? Because that was, you were quite, kind of loud, so I think everybody heard it. We need to repeat it, it for, the, to, for the cameras. Repeat it anyway. So the question is, um, the gentleman's asking, if content view promotion is slow in general, is there any way to speed it up? And my answer would be twofold, because first of all, if you use a dedicated puppet content view, that is actually really fast. That is sub one minute for publishing a promotion. So that is not uh, significantly slower than doing it through R10K. That should not slow down your workflow. Um, for, for the content views in general with RPMs, um, I think that really depends on the hardware you're putting under it. Uh, I don't know if you, you have any pointers there, but... Uh, yeah, so just as a general rule, if you haven't heard this already, run your satellites on RHEL 7. <laughs> XFS makes a huge difference here, okay? Like, I will pay you to run your satellite on RHEL 7, okay? That being said, if you think about what a content view is, like philosophically, it is a group of content that effectively lives on the same life cycle, right? So if you want to bundle your RPMs and your puppet modules into the same content view, what you're effectively saying is that these two things live on the same life cycle, which that usually makes sense once your puppet content is mature. So what that means is that your publishing and promotion time uh, is something that is a property of how often you patch. 
right? And for most organizations, we're talking that's usually either monthly or uh, monthly, quarterly, semi-annually, or annually. So the speed of uh, publishing a content view usually isn't that painful because it's not something you do that often. Uh, he's giving me the shaky head, so he's like, no, Rich, I don't believe you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so is that because of like a CI, CD workflow? Okay, well, that explains it. <laughs> yeah, so we are uh, you know, working on improving content view promotion publish times. There was actually a bug we fixed in the 6.1 line where we were creating an exponential amount of inodes when we, uh, when we published, which was actually slowing down publishing time. Uh, and that's something we're always investigating. Uh, but there's going to always be kind of play whack-a-mole with performance there. But that's definitely something that is a, a focus target for us. So maybe, um, maybe a little addition to that. In the repository we mentioned before, there is a script to remove a, uh, the, the old content views you have automatically after a certain amount of time. And that frees up, for example, a lot of the space that Satellite uses in MongoDB to store all the metadata around those content views. So cleaning that up is a good practice if you want this to be snappier. Right. Also, there is, um, I, I think it was a fairly recent update on the Satellite 6 performance guide. Yes. So you might want to take a look at that because that has some good pointers around um, you know, general performance tuning for Satellite right. 6 uh, as a right. whole. Unfortunately, we are now out of time, okay. and I know we're between you and beer. So more questions. We're, we're going to hang around at the front here, so please come and talk to us, and we'll answer any other questions you've got. Thanks for attending, guys, Thank and you. please fill in the survey. Yeah, yeah and, and rate us highly, because they traveled all the way here from, uh, from Holland and the country formerly known as the United, United Kingdom. Kingdom. Uh, so please rate us highly to make their trip worth it. Thank you much. Thanks, Phil. Thank you.